Hey, good morning, Morning Star. Great to, to be with you. Sun's shining outside. We're able to gather and worship. Uh, hey, Robin and Christina, Martin, Jennifer, Emily, Mary, a uh, lot of you uh, who are already logged on this morning. You're early. Hey, that's more than we usually have this time on uh, 11 o'clock live, right? And you get, a, you get to do this from your own couch, right? You've got your, your temperature set just the way you want it. You can adjust the volume uh, any way you want it. I mean, it. don't get too comfortable there, all right? Because this is going to pass. We'll eventually get back here to actually worship together. But until then, uh, we're thankful uh, to God for the technology and the great folks uh, in our creative arts department like Robin and Elizabeth who are going over and beyond these days to, uh, to bring us these services. Hey, uh, if you're with us uh, new, I'm Mike. I'm the pastor here, and it is great to welcome you. We've got a great service planned today. Pastor Keith is here to bring a message that uh, I heard on Wednesday uh, when he previewed it. It was so incredibly timely to what we're going through today, and it is good news, and we need some some good news, don't we? So listen, do me a favor. Uh, if you haven't already, sign in on the comment section of the uh, uh, of Facebook to let us know you're watching and who else is watching with you. Uh, again, I'm going to give a shout out to the uh, to the folks who haven't already done so. Please, please sign up for the Morning Star app. The easiest way for you to uh, do your, your online connect card, your, your tithe, your sermon notes, your prayer request, all of those. Um, so please do that. But if you do me a, a favor today, uh, after we have these first couple songs, I'm going to come back for our prayer time. And I would love to pray for any specific needs that you have. So right now, the best way to do it is right here on the comment section. If you just share your pr uh, prayer concerns, uh, I'll write those down and be back in a few minutes. But right now... Um, let's just take a, a big collective deep breath and uh, tune out everything else that's going on. And maybe you have to turn some stuff off, uh, make sure the kiddos are, are set and they have something. If they're not worshiping with you, something they can do for the next hour. And let's just, uh, let's just prepare our hearts to be in the presence of God. Invite you to stand right now. Uh, seriously, let's stand and let's sing together. We're going to sing about an echo. And my prayer is that maybe uh, in your house, you sing so loud that there's an echo outside your house and your neighbors are like, what's going on? People are worshiping God inside that house. Let's stand and worship. Welcome home to Morningstar Church. We're so glad you guys are joining us online in worship. I know it might be weird, but we'd love it if you guys would sing with us. When night has fallen, and fear is calming, still you're calling me. When faith is lost and my hope exhausted, you will be my strength. When my mind says I'm not.
continue in worship and we sing those lyrics out together, I pray that you would claim those, that you would truly believe that you are not a prisoner to anything because you have been set free. Right now, a lot of us are really struggling with fear and anxiety. And I want you to know that you are not a prisoner to that, that Christ's sacrifice was so that you don't have to worry, that your eternity is secure in him. And that's what we get to celebrate. So let's do that together as we sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, I will see priest and now I'm now with your blood, you hope my feet. Hey, the uh, 
The good news is that with all the borders being shut down, the national borders, uh, states closing borders, uh, some of us being quarantined uh, in our own homes, the truth is uh, that we are not in prison, that we have freedom in Jesus Christ who came to give his life to pay for our sins so that nothing could separate us from God, that we would know his unconditional love and his amazing grace, that we would not only have the assurance of being able to go to heaven when we die, but to experience a foretaste of heaven right now. And I know, I know it feels far from a foretaste of, of heaven right now from us, but the kingdom of God, friends, is still in our midst because God has equipped his church to be present uh, even uh, in, in virtual ways like this. Uh, and yet, uh, even through our New Hope Resource Center, prayer ministry, uh, lots of ways the church is still being the church. I uh, want to take us to the book of Lamentations. If you're following along and, and doing the daily readings uh, through the long story short, you know that we read a little bit in Jeremiah. Uh, one of the major prophets, and Jeremiah wrote a second book called Lamentations, and, and Lamentations are, are laments, which are cries to God. In the midst of, of this terrible stuff we're going through, I'm going to cry out to God, and you know that Jeremiah, his, his ministry was difficult. It was opposition uh, at every corner, just uphill all the way, and, uh, and I think his words in Lamentations 3 uh, spoke to me this week because he names it. He's, he's, he's not afraid to name his grief and, and the oppression, but yet he turns it then to praise. Listen to what he says, beginning at verse 19. The thought of my affliction and my homelessness is wormwood and gall. Not sure what wormwood and gall is, but it ain't good, right? My soul continually thinks of it, and it's bowed down within me. But this I call to mind. And therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. The Lord is my portion. Therefore I will hope in him. Hey, we've been apportioned a lot of things right now. And maybe you're focusing on, you know having to stay home and the kids at home and maybe you're, you're even out of work or work is compromised. All of us have certainly been apportioned something that is challenging us right now. But, but the one thing that doesn't change is the portion of God. That he is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He is faithful and he has chosen to be with us. Jesus has come to make God known to us and has sent the Holy Spirit for God to dwell in us. So uh, we have this privilege now to be able to go to God in prayer. would invite you to, to uh, just bow your heads with me wherever you are. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to join together in prayer. And through the uh, airwaves here, we are one. You tell us where two or more are gathered. You are there among us. And we trust, God, that you are here among us. Yes, we pray for what's going on in our nation and in our world. Uh, we pray pray for a cure for this. We pray for um, folks to take this seriously, God. There, is, there, is, there are ways that we can keep this uh, from spreading, and just we pray that, that folks would actually take seriously the social distancing right now and the hand washing, simple measures that can really reduce the spread of this. God, we pray for continued wisdom for our government leaders and, and, and those uh, you know, in the medical industry on the front lines. Of, of dealing not only with this virus, but God, all the other needs and, and concerns that continue to happen every day for, for the people who are in the hospital and the nursing homes that can't be visited by their family members right now and family members who can't get to their loved ones. God, we pray for our students and, uh, and, and just the unknown uh, that they're dealing with and probably a lot of the stir craziness and that we're feeling as adults and parents and, and grandparents as well, that we have a desire to, to be out and connect. So, so just comfort us and give us peace. Um, in the midst of the anxiety and worry, God, just give us some calm and reassurance that, that we're going to get through this, that this is going to be a difficult season, but it's a season. It, in the end, it is temporary, and we will come through this. God, I, uh, I pray specifically 
for Lori Shaw's kids, our, our stepkids. Uh, they lost the grandma last night. And so, Lori, thanks for sharing that with us, that we can lift uh, all of you up and, and pray uh, peace that passes understanding upon those grandkids and the, the loss of their, their grandmother. Uh, Father, we, uh, we love you, and we ask for you to uh, speak to us, each one, meet us right where we are, and give us a word from you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, uh, before the, the band comes back and, and shares one last song, uh, it's our time of generosity, a time to worship God through the giving of our tithes and gifts and offerings. And I just want to say thank you to those of you who have never given online before, but you've shifted your giving online or you've upped your giving because of you understand right now that the church needs to stay strong. If ever there was a time where the church's message, a message of hope uh, is important, it's in times like these. So I just want to say thank you for your faithfulness and your support to, uh, to help us see, uh, see our way through this, to continue to, to provide services like this and our midweek offerings and through the New Hope Resource Center to continue to provide uh, personal essentials to folks who were struggling with, with needing needs like toilet paper before this virus and, and even more so right now as well as uh, getting food to our kids through the Backpack Impact Ministry. Those things continue to go on because of you and your faithfulness. So uh, if you are looking for a way to give and you haven't been able to do that, uh, we hope to have a button on Facebook uh, in the next week or so that you can make a donation. But right now, just go to our website and, uh, and you'll see it right there at the top of the website on the banner, or you can do that on the app. Right now, I invite you to stand back up. If you sit down, stand back up, and uh, let's put our voices together and worship the Lord. Show enough at the tomb of every. 
Well, how is everybody? My name is Keith, and welcome to Morningstar Online Campus. We are so glad to have you guys with us. I don't know about you, I'm a little stir crazy. Uh, how are you guys doing on all this at home business? I hope you're doing well. Hey, do me a favor. Uh, in your comments, would you just comment, I need some binge watching material, all right? So could you give me a couple of shows that, you know, must see, I have to do it now. Robin's going to put in The Bachelor. Robin loves The I don't want anything like that. I'm looking for good binge-watching TV. I don't know if you uh, saw, but on Basic Cable, I have Basic Cable, um, one of the channels was showing the Rocky movies back to back to back, and I did not want to see the Rocky movies, okay? But, you know, you kind of tune in for the first one, and, and he loses, and so you're like, well, you got to watch the second one now. And then uh, next thing you know, it's my favorite one, Rocky Three. The reason that I like the third Rocky is because Mr. T, right? And then it's got that great, great line, you know, classic Hollywood line from Rocky. He looks at Mr. T, and he says, Go for it, you know. So Shakespeare couldn't on his best day couldn't do that, and so uh, so it's Rocky Three. And why do I like that one so much? I'll tell you why. It's the comeback, right? It's the comeback. I mean, at the beginning of the movie, Rocky is going to fight Mr. T. They get in the scuffle. He pushes. Uh, Mickey, Rocky's trainer, Mickey dies, and so now Rocky has to get a new trainer. It's Apollo Creed, his former enemy, right? And then they get into the the ring. Finally, at the end of the music, at the end of the uh, of the match, cue the Rocky music, right? And it's the comeback, right? Rocky comes back. Now, the best part of every story is the comeback. I mean, you you only have to ask our friends who are Kansas City Chief fans. Can I get a whoop whoop from Kansas City Chiefs? They had a great season, didn't they? Their first playoff game, they were down 24 points, and they came back to win. And the AFC Championship and the Super Bowl, they were down by 10, but the Chiefs fans were like, well, we got them right where we want them. Cue the comeback, right? But now, that's not my favorite comeback. See, I, I love the Chiefs. I thought it was a great season, and I'm a Missourian, but first and foremost, I'm a St. Louisan, right? And so the best comeback of all time, 2011, right? Game six, we are in the ninth inning. We are down to our last strike, and at the plate, local boy, David Freeze, right? And he gets up, and he knocks one. He hits it really hard off the right field wall. It it clears the bases. It's a tie game, right? Only Now, uh, extra innings, David Freeze himself comes back up in the 11th inning. He clubs one, the straight center field. You remember the batter's eye? It, one guy jumped out of the stands and went over and grabbed the ball. And another local guy, Joe Buck, screams through the microphone, we will see you tomorrow night. What a great comeback. Nobody slept that night, especially the Texas Rangers. And game seven was a lock, right? The St. Louis Cardinals won their 11th World Series. It's God's team, in case you didn't know, all right? I'll get comments on that, God's team. But it's the comeback, right? Man, we love the comeback. Hey, if you're just joining us today, uh, we're in this message series called Long Story Short. We're doing this, uh, this series of the Bible. It's actually the longest series we've ever done at Morningstar. It's 13 weeks. And uh, we're right, right smack in the middle of it right now. And uh, if you're just joining us, let me kind of give you an, an update. Uh, we started, you know, it's going from Genesis to Revelation. So we started at the creation. And uh, God is a creative God who wants to have relationship with you and I. Then we went to the promise. God promises an elderly couple, late 70s, right, that they would become a mighty nation, even though they'd never had any children. After that, it was the Exodus, let my people go, right? Moses uh, uh, and fights with the Pharaoh and crosses through the Red Sea. Out there, we find out that God does not want just a small relationship, wants to have a deep covenant relationship with us. And so he introduces the way that he wants us to live. Then finally, Joshua, they cross through the Jordan River, you remember? They cross through the Jordan River into the promised land. And uh, once there, the people want a king. Like God says, well, I'm going to give you a king. Like, no, we can't wait. We want Everybody else has a king. All the cool kids have a king. We want a king. And they finally get a king. It doesn't always work out that well, but we did talk about Saul. We talk about David and Solomon. 
talk about how the, the, the nation rebelled then. Last week, Pastor Jennifer was here and talked about the, the prophets, and it was the warning, right? And that, that God, in fact, she shared this slide with us, and she wanted me to let you know that she had all these spelled right. It was the machine's fault. It was the machine's fault. We got it spelled right, though, today. Here's this great slide, right? It has to do with uh, the cycle of our lives, cycle of the folks in the Bible, but also the cycle of our lives, right? We have sin and rebellion. Then we, we have consequences. Oppression comes in. And then deliverance. God is always faithful and always there. In fact, this is the cycle of God's faithfulness. The people around God continue to sin and rebel, but God is always faithful and delivers us. And so before we get into scripture today, I need to explain a concept to you. It's the concept of consequences, okay? See, the trouble is when we read this verse, we followers of Jesus, we read this verse and we think this is a pretty good deal, right? It says the wages of sin is death. Well, that doesn't sound too good. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. I can remember when I was a youth pastor. I was a youth pastor at Echo Mountain Church in Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, one of the smart kids in my youth group uh, raised his hand one day. I let him ask questions in the middle of sermons all the time, and he raised his hand. He said, Pastor Keith said, let me ask you something. He said, uh, looks to me like we got a win-win situation here. God loves to forgive people of their sin, and I love to sin. He says, so why are we working so hard to try to stop sinning? And it had to do with consequences, right? That no matter uh, what we do, yes, God is willing to forgive us. We can find forgiveness from our sins on a daily basis from our God. However, all of our actions, what we do today, impacts what will happen to us tomorrow, right? We have consequences for our actions. Now, a couple of years ago, uh, I ran a church in the city, uh, the Word at Shaw, and uh, it was located right next to one of the St. Louis public schools. And so I had the privilege for seven years, I taught in their schools life skills to second, third, fourth, and fifth graders. And one of the lessons that I taught was about consequences, all right? And I'd ask the question, uh, are consequences good or bad? And the kids would always say, bad. <laughs> And then I just kind of wait them out a little. And they, well, maybe it isn't bad. Maybe it's good. Maybe it's a little of both. Here's what the Bible has to say about it. Yeah, consequences are both good and bad, depending on how, what, what we put into them, right? We, we know this, right? If we eat well and we exercise, there are good consequences. And if we don't, there's bad consequences. Look what Solomon had to say. He said, the evil deeds of the wicked ensnare them. We all have a sin nature. We all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. He says, the cords of their sins hold them fast. Look at the image there. It's talking about, hey, we all sin and there are consequences to it. In fact, our sins are like cords. They, they hold us down. They tie us down. They keep us from accomplishing what God has created us to be. And so I need you to understand that as we go in. Yes, we have a loving and a forgiving, gracious God, a patient God, and yet there are consequences to our actions. You got it? Okay. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd like you to turn with me to 2 Chronicles. All right, now, in the way that the Bible is laid out, uh, the very first part of the Bible is the history portion. There's the Torah and the history portion of the Bible is the first few books of the Bible. Then as we go along, there's more poetry and uh, wisdom, scripture of wisdom, gets into mi major and minor prophets. There's really, uh, it, major prophet just means they wrote more. That's all that means. And nobody was more important than the other, but there are major prophets and minor prophets. But it, at the first part of it, it's all history. And so all these other things were written at the time during these. So you gotta, it's just the way the Bible is laid out. And so today, we're going to finish the story of the Old Testament. We're going, to, we're going to go through all of those history books and finish that today, all right? And so we're going to be in 2 Chronicles, and then we'll be in a book called Ezra and a book called Nehemiah a little bit later. Have you found it? 2 Chronicles, we're going to go to the 36th chapter, and uh, we'll begin to read. Now, 
we're going to talk about the comeback today, but before we do that, I'm going to need to back up and kind of get a running start at it, okay? So we're going to tell the story real quick one more time, and then we'll cue the comeback, all right? Here it goes. Uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 15. It says, The Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word to them through his messengers again and again. This is what Pastor Jennifer preached on last week. The prophets were there, his messengers. And but because he why did he do that? God did that because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. See, God knows you, loves you, and wants what's best for you. And so constantly God is giving us through his word, through other people, in this case through the prophets, he's giving us these warnings. Hey, you need to do this, all right? And not only is he concerned about his people, he's concerned about his dwelling place. Listen, the temple of God in Jerusalem, that was a holy spot. And he gave gave it to these people. They were in charge. They were responsible for it. And the idea here is God was concerned about it, all right? Keep going. Verse 16. But they, the people, mocked God's messengers, the prophets. They despised his words, and they scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people, and there was no remedy. Listen, God is patient, and God is merciful, but also God understands when, that's, when enough is enough. God understands when the consequences have piled up so big that there's nothing more that he can do, and so he steps back, and he allows the consequences to take hold, all right? God knows when enough is enough. So he brought up against them the king of the Babylonians who killed their young men with the sword in the sanctuary. Think about this. This is not what he's describing here. It's not just a a, a war that took place at the city wall. He's describing as one, no, they they swooped in and they went all the way even into the sanctuary and killed everybody they found. And they did not spare even young men or young women, the elderly or the infirmed. God gave them all into the hands of King Nebuchadnezzar. Maybe you've heard of him, the warlord king of Babylon. Now, then he, Nebuchadnezzar, carried to Babylon all the articles from the temple of God, both large and small, and the treasures of the Lord's temple, and the treasures of the king, and all of his officials. So you're getting the image here. Uh, The Babylonians swoop into Jerusalem. They sack the city. That Now they kill everybody, and now they're looting uh, all the treasures. It says, they set fire to God's temple and broke down the wall of Jerusalem. They burned all the palaces and destroyed everything of value there. And so the Babylonians come in and they wreck the place. Uh, Everything is left in ruins and rubble and they loot the place and they kill most of the people. Now he says, he carried them into exile. Uh, he carried into exile to Babylon the remnant, all right, those who escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him and his successors until the kingdom of Persia came along. All right, so now this was a, a standard practice of the Babylonians. Uh, they would take part, uh, conquer a city. They would take all the treasures from it, kill most of the people, but they'd spare a remnant. They take the quality people, the people who were the athletic, the, the, the best of the best, they would take and bring them back to Babylon. This was one of their strategies for conquering the world. This was one of the strategies for growing their empire. All right, now, you guys have probably already heard the stories of this Babylonian captivity. Uh, they're some of the most iconic stories uh, in Bible school, right, when we were kids. It's, this is where... Uh, Daniel in the lion's den took place. You guys have heard that. In fact, we told that in one of our pandemonium services, right? Daniel in the lion's den. It's also the place where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you remember the the three uh, children of Israel who were uh, condemned by King Nebuchadnezzar to the fiery furnace? And they, they, they went in there and the fire did not consume them. In fact, the king had an observation deck. He looked over into the furnace and there were not three, there were four in there. The incarnate Christ, God himself, found himself, was in that furnace dancing with the children of Israel. That all happened during this time. The, also, the very first thing that happened, maybe you remember this story as well, 
When they brought all of the people, the remnant, into Babylon, uh, Daniel and, and several of his friends were part of this. And uh, the people of Babylon began to feed them the food of Babylon. And uh, D- Daniel kept kosher. And so Daniel, actually, if you read the story, he kind of bribes the guard who's in charge. And kinda, they, they come up with a deal and he says, listen, give us two weeks. We're going to keep eating kosher. Give us two weeks and you'll see. Everybody else who's spent their whole life eating kosher, now eating, they're not going to be worth shooting, right? But we're still going to be sharp. Uh, Again, you do good things, you have good consequences, right? You do bad things, you have bad consequences. At the end of the two weeks, the guard decides, oh, yeah, these guys are right. Now, long story short, Daniel moves up into the court of the king, okay? He becomes a high-ranking official in the court of the king. He's an interpreter of dreams, And so he's very high and up there. In fact, uh, some Bible scholars will tell you that if it weren't for Daniel chapter 2, where Daniel rises to power, you wouldn't have Matthew chapter 2. Think about this. Daniel rises to this place, and around him, he surrounds himself with a sect of people that are referred to as seers or wise men. And uh, that sect continued long after Daniel's life was over. In fact, we know the Christmas story, Matthew 2. In the Christmas story, uh, magi come from the east, Persia, the wise men, okay? Many Bible scholars say that's that sect that Daniel started. We wouldn't have Matthew 2 if it wasn't for Daniel 2. In fact, you remember the, the Christmas story, the magi come and they finance the Holy Family. They bring gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It's all about the myrrh, babe, right? And they bring that, and that allows Mary and Joseph to escape to Egypt when Herod the king is killing all the baby male babies to and under. Jesus escapes that. Why? Because of Daniel's work. It, all through the long story short, all through the Bible, we find God acting years in advance and playing things out. Now, here's where the people had rebelled, and they're in exile, and yet the king that they had wanted so desperately was saved because of Daniel's work while in exile. You see how it fits together? Here's another great example of this. Here comes King Cyrus. We're about to cue the comeback, all right? Hit the Rocky music. It's coming. Okay, here it is. It says, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word that the Lord had spoken by Jeremiah... The Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, the king of Persia. This is very interesting. About 70 years have passed from the time that Jerusalem was sacked to uh, Persia and then 13 years of this reign of the king when we're introduced to a guy named Joshua and a guy named Zerubbabel. All right, Zerubbabel, great name in the Bible. You may have never heard of it before, okay? Going to hear his story today. Cyrus actually opens the door for Joshua. And by the way, this isn't the Joshua that Pastor Mike talked about. There's been many years in between, okay? Joshua and Zerubbabel to go back and reestablish the temple and the city of Jerusalem, all right? And what's cool about this is this is one of the prophets that that Pastor Jennifer was talking about uh, last week is Jeremiah. And Jeremiah said this was going to happen, but Isaiah said it even better. Look at this. This is... This is 150 years prior to Cyrus's birth, all right? Talk about a prophecy, right? This is the prophet of God, Isaiah, forecasting, hey, God is going to be tired of your sin. It's going to come to a point of no return. You're going to be overthrown by a warlord king. You're going to be put into exile. But this guy, this is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armor, Nebuchadnezzar, to open doors before him so that the gates will not be shut. Isaiah foretells of this King Cyrus. And King Cyrus, not only does he allow Zerubbabel and Joshua and Joshua and a few more of the remnant to return to Jerusalem, he finances the trip. And more than that, he opens up the coffers and they pull out all of the things that Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple. He said, take this back and put this in the temple of your God. 
Go back and build this. All right? You ready for the comeback? We're going to go to the next book. It's the book of Ezra. Ezra tells the story of Joshua and Zerubbabel. Here it is. Then Joshua and Zerubbabel, there's a great name. Uh, they began to build the altar of God, the God of Israel, to sacrifice burnt offerings on it in accordance with what is written in the law of Moses. Despite their fear of the peoples around them, they built the altar on its foundation and they sacrificed burnt offerings there on it. Now, interesting, as they're coming back through and they're, the, 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 the enemies of Israel are all around Jerusalem and they're watching and they're thinking, who are these guys and they're, uh, is this power, this was a great power of one day, are they going to be coming back? And so the Zerubbabel is very concerned about the enemy around them, but they don't build the walls for defense. The first thing they build is the foundation of the great temple. Now, we've been at this site. Many of us were in the Holy Land this past fall. We've been at the Temple Mount. This is that place. And, and that big temple, that great mighty temple of Solomon that had been built some 70 years, uh, almost 83 years ago, had now been toppled, right? And now on that same site, here the foundation is being built. And the first thing they do is they build an altar to God and they begin to sacrifice there. All right. Again, long story short, keep moving. We're going to go to Nehemiah. The next book of the Old Testament is the book of Nehemiah. It's this young guy that God raises up to power in the kingdom. He is the cup, the king's cup bearer. Now, in the theme park business, we would say he's the director of inter, or he's the director of food and beverage. I was the director of entertainment. He was the director of food and beverage, right? And there, that put him in, in charge of all the banquets, but more than that, in charge of feeding the king. So you can imagine he and the king were close. Well, one day, uh, Nehemiah is walking through the palace, and the king says, why so glum, chum? Like, why are you so down? And Nehemiah says, well, how am I supposed to be happy when my motherland, the home of my ancestors, lies in ruins? And the king loved Nehemiah so much, he, he financed him. He set him up. He said, I tell you what, why don't you, we're going to give you a hiatus from here. We're going to let you go back to your homeland. Ne Nehemiah had never been there before. He was born in exile. He said, go back and you can rebuild the walls. And more than that, the king gives him a letter. And he says, look, all the way through, every kingdom you pass through, present this letter and they'll let you pass safely. But more than that, they will give you the supplies that will be needed to build the walls around Jerusalem. And sure enough, Nehemiah, never been to Jerusalem before, now brings these people with him. They go back. There's just a foundation of the temple and an altar there. And Jeremiah, or I'm sorry, Nehemiah begins to build a walls. Now, I should have said, that was 70 years after that. So now we're 150 years after the sacking of Jerusalem and the tearing down of the temple. This is when Nehemiah comes back 150 years later. And so for 150 years, this city has laid in ruin. And Nehemiah, who was born in exile, a stranger, returns. And get this, in 52 days, Nehemiah builds the wall. He's a great manager and a great developer of people. And, and, he, and he, it's a long story short. He builds the wall all the way around it. It only takes 52 days. What had been in ruin for 150 years now is restored in just 52 days. All right, now, cue the comeback. Ezra, the priest, is there. And Nehemiah, on this, plat on this foundation, sets up a platform and he says, inside these city walls, we're going to have a worship service to our God. The first time that God had been worshiped in the city for over 150 years. And Nehemiah tells the story in his book. Look at chapter 8. Here's what happened. Again, long story short, but here's what happened. Ezra steps up on the platform and he has Holy Scripture with him. And for the first time in 50 years, Ezra opened the book, and as he opened it, the people all stood. 
There's great anticipation of what's about to happen. The word of God is about to be read once again in the God's city, the city of Jerusalem, at God's temple on the Temple Mount. And Ezra praised the Lord, uh, uh, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and they said, Amen, Amen. You ever been to a worship service like that? Man, they're just calling out, they're just praising God. And then they bowed down and they worshiped the Lord at his temple. The comeback was complete. Now, that may be the end of the history portion of the Old Testament, but it's not the end of this story. You and I can begin to apply this to our lives today. Listen, I don't know where you are today, but my guess is most of the people who are listening to me today are looking for a comeback, right? Listen, you may be uh, ill from this virus. Uh, you may be in the hospital today, not from the virus, but just from something else, but are lonely because your relatives, your closest loved ones can't can't go into the hospital to see you. Maybe you've been laid off from your job. Maybe you're not sure if your job will reopen. Maybe you find yourself uh, in an elderly living place and you feel more lonely and more isolated than ever before. Maybe it is that you've been surrounded by your family and, and while all seems to be good, frankly, you're tired of those kids and those kids are tired of you and you're looking for a comeback. Listen, whatever your situation is today, you are primed and ready for a comeback. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the long story short is still God and is still waiting to be present in your life today. And so I've, I've got a couple of keys to the comeback, a couple of observations from this story that I want to share with you today. This is the way that you can have a comeback from where you find yourself today. Here's four keys. The first one is recognize that God is at work. The same God that we've been looking at through this whole long story short, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who delivered the people into the promised land, that God is still at work today. And I know that in this time, it's difficult. Sometimes it's difficult, but just look at the church as being the church. Just look at God. God is at work all around us. Recognize that first. Next then, I want you to, to repent, start your life anew. This is the consequences thing, isn't it? It's repenting, it's starting over, right? I'm not going to go in the way that I went. I'm going to begin to do things God's way, all right? God knows you and knows when enough is enough. And the consequences of your life may have taken over at this point, but I can tell you this, all you have to do is stop, repent, which is a Bible word. It just means turn around, go the other way and move towards Jesus. Can I tell you something about my life? After I repented, after I turned around and, and, and went Christ way, I looked back and I went, what was I waiting for? Uh, life was so much better after I practiced this law of repentance and began to put good things into my life and good things began to come of it. Those are the consequences, right? And that's what God wants for you. Here's the next thing. Build an altar. Now, the last time that we all were in this room, Pastor Mike preached on the conquest. Do you remember? And it was Joshua going through the Jordan River. The Jordan River parted again. And the people went through on dry land. But as they were going through, Joshua said to the elders of each of the 12 tribes, everyone, pick up one of these rocks. All 12 rocks came out of the riverbed. And they built an altar right there on the other side of the Jordan River, just inside the promised land. He said, why are we building this altar? He said, so for ages to come, our children will come by and say, what's that altar about? We'll be able to say, the God who delivered us into the promised land is still at work in our lives. And so, do you still have that rock, right? Before, before we all left, Pastor Mike handed out rocks and everybody went home with a rock. You still have that rock? That's your altar, 
get that out. Remind yourself that God is at work in my life. He worked before, he'll work again. And the final thing, hey, listen. You're supposed to build an altar and sacrifice yourself on it, right? I mean, the Bible says it like this. This is the Apostle Paul. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in light of God's mercy, that you offer your bodies, your lives as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. So I don't know where you find yourself today. Uh, maybe you're down and out and tired of being alone. Maybe this sickness has come to you and, and you're trying to get through it. Maybe you long for your loved ones who are in a hospital or in a senior care living place and you can't go visit them physically. Maybe, maybe your kids and you miss all your friends. Maybe this is your senior year. And you're worried about graduation and prom and all those great things that you've been looking forward to. Maybe you just find yourself desperate and alone today. The concept here is to recognize God's at work, turn toward him, build an altar, sacrifice yourself. When I say sacrifice yourself, what I mean is I want you to lay down all of those things. Jesus said it like this. If you want to gain your life, you must be willing to lose it to lay down all of those gifts, all of those talents, surrender all to him. Listen, right where you are today, you can have a comeback moment in your life. This could be the day. Cue the Rocky music. This could be the day where you say, I make the Lord my Lord. And I surrender everything. And all those things that I thought were so valuable, that I held on to so desperately, I turn them over to you, God. I turn them over to you right here and right now. Make this the day. Hey, something great can come out of this bad period in our, in our history. Something great can happen right here, right now for you. That you can receive this love and forgiveness that Christ has for you. The God of the universe, the God of our fathers is still available. He's not surprised by this virus. He's still seated on his throne. He still loves you, cares for you, and wants nothing more than to be closer than close, or as Pastor Mike would say, gooder than good. Let's pray. Father God, in this place, we recognize you as the Lord of all. God, forgive us for the times when we thought we were Lord when we moved you out of the driver's seat and stepped in. God, for the numerous times that you showed great patience, gave us plenty of warning, and yet we still went astray. Forgive us. And now in this place, Lord, may we be like that worship service that Ezra oversaw. As the word of God is open before us and over these past few weeks and the weeks to come, we've been studying it more than ever before. May you be more real to us in this time than ever before. God, may we raise our hands and scream hallelujah and amen because we recognize you in this place. God, may our lives be changed forevermore and we would not go back to the to the busy hustle and bustle of what our, we had made of our lives, but instead we would focus on you and your kingdom's work in this place. This is our prayer, Father, and we pray it uh, as one unified body meeting across the country. We ask it in the name of the one who came, died, and rose again, Jesus, who is more than capable of handling all of this and more. It's in his name we pray, amen and amen. Hey, God bless you. We'll see you later this week.